guys welcome to badass reviews and this is pick up that remote and today i'm going to review the first five episodes or the first half of hbo's watchmen series i mean i'm a ma massive massive comic book fan i think a lot of you all know that and uh, watchman is a seminal graphic novel um, from the 80s you know created by comparable alan moore and Dave Gibbons and this series from Damon Lindelof it, um, it acts as a sequel to that particular graphic novel it doesn't tie into the uh, Zack Snyder directed film from 2009 and in fact it takes place after uh, the events of the Watchmen graphic novel and um, I mean I am in love absolutely enthralled by this series so far it's only been five episodes you can catch it on hbo hbo go wherever you watch hbo and um i mean and before i i'm, I'm going to review the first five episodes so i'm going to go into really really heavy spoilers here so only keep listening if you've watched the first five episodes if you have not go watch those five episodes and then come back and maybe you might agree with my uh, ruminations about the uh, Watchmen series on HBO so far. So as I mentioned, it's um, five episodes have um, passed so far. It's basically halfway through the series. Um, it's scheduled to run for nine episodes, um, similar to the nine panels in the graphic novel itself. So I think a lot of um, us fans caught up to that even. And um, what can I say? It's from Damon Lindelof. He's the creator of Lost, uh, The Leftovers. He wrote a lot of episodes on those two series. And he's uh, quite famous for creating this uh, mythology heavy um, episodes and series that delve uh, deep into the storylines and uh, it, um, it makes you want to go and check on forums way back in 2004 that he did for Lost. That's what I used to do. And uh, when Leftovers came out, came out, we had Reddit, which is where I used to troll. And now with Watchmen, I'm trolling Reddit again for uh, you know discussions, uh, Easter eggs, and um, in fact, just uh, for like-minded people to share their opinions about the episodes. And it's bringing me right back into that same feeling I had uh, you know, 15 years ago, and. Uh, uh, four or five years ago from the Lost uh, and the Leftover series. So I'm going to go into an episode by episode uh, kind of a simple review and uh, and you know disagree or agree with me I can uh, guarantee you one thing you will be entertained especially if you're a big fan of the graphic novel if not you will still be uh, flabbergasted by some of the scenes I have to admit uh, but thoroughly entertained nevertheless. And so what can I say about episode one? Uh, so episode one, it opens, the whole series opens on this um, rather uh, dark mark in, in the history of race relations in the United States uh, and an incident that's not very well known to most people outside of the States and in fact from what I've read to some, that, uh, who, to some of the uh, people in the States as well um, the Tulsa, Oklahoma riots, uh, the massacre in that happened in 1921, and immediately it tells you that you know this show is going to delve deep into politics, just as the graphic novel did, and gonna it's gonna you know punch you in the gut with some of the scenes, and uh, and the first episode does just right that. Well, the scenes that caught my eye without a doubt was the cow farm attack by the 7th Cavalry who have kind of twisted um, Rorschach's journal, his, his manifesto of sorts into a white supremacist kind of uh, manifesto and using that, uh, his journal to um, well, commit crimes. And yeah, if you uh, read the uh, original novel, Rorschach himself is kind of a um, I wouldn't say left or right, center right possibly, a leaning person. He believed that um, a lot of things that were happening were due to a certain kind of people 
certain type of people from a certain socio-academic strata and uh, the 7th Cavalry who were the antagonists of this show have kind of twisted his uh, learnings to their own use and um, in that cow farm attack I mean he goes all out the character goes all out the action is great it's very realistic and uh, again as I mentioned it's uh, it is a comic book a gra graphic it's based on a graphic novel and it's also based in a superhero world uh, but the first episode doesn't really show much of superpowers and the only time you see is in that particular cow farm attack scene where Archie um, the um, the famous Minuteman's Night Owl, his um, airship, you get to see the police, the Tulsa police using that airship as a mode of transportation. So the first spoiler, the main character that we are led to believe he is the main character, um, played by Don Johnson, the chief um, judge, a prophet, the chief of police, he gets killed at the end of episode one, and a small sliver of blood drips from his body down his uh, legs and falls on his uh, sheriff badge uh, chief of police badge sorry which lies on the floor and it falls in the exact same way that the blood drips on the uh, smiley button from the graphic novel that was a great uh, not for comic book fan for the graphic novel fans and that's how episode one ends and then so you know right away this is I mean, I can't wait for the next episode. I've got to wait a week. And so, episode two starts off with a bang as well. Regina King, who plays uh, another main character, um, she plays Sister Knight in this uh, show. Uh, she's a great character, acted very well by Regina King, who is an Academy Award winner. She won for Bill Street Good Talk. So, many of us know how well she acts. And in this role, she actually gets to kick some ass, in fact. Um, of course, you know, it's probably a stunt, um, a stunt double that's doing most of the action, but the fact that there are a lot of camera shots where you can actually see her face, see her doing the action sequences, um, and, and her character um, is one of the most kick-ass characters you have seen in a long time, and it seems, it, she, she seems to be well adapted in this whole universe created by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. And, um, Another character that I also like, introduced also in the first two episodes, is Red Scare, and he is hilarious. Uh, he plays this uh, Soviet-leaning, uh, gopnik kind of character, and he has some of the best one-liners in the show so far. And um, so, just to give you a brief, basically, uh, as I mentioned, the show takes place after the end of the novel, where uh, you know the overlying theme was the Doomsday Clock. Uh, being like two minutes and then one minute away from midnight uh, at the advent of a nuclear war between the Soviet Union and uh, the United States. So in this timeline, after the advance, after what Jose Mendez did, unleashing the squid and you know, uh, the squid, the giant monster squid at the end, stop that from happening. So the Soviet Union is still around, and the Red Scare is somebody who. Is probably from the Soviet Union. He plays a Cockney character, and so and, and uh, so a few other things from episode two. Robert Redford is the president now. Yes, that Robert Redford, the actor Robert Redford. So if you remember from a graphic novel, it, uh, novel it was hinted that R. R. would be the new president. We all thought it would be Ronald Reagan uh, until the end. We kind of find out that it's actually Robert Redford. He has become president, and he has been president for thirty years, which means. Um, he was not he was re-elected further than the two terms which is the norm and he has kind of put in uh, reparations for the race riots um, the victims of the race riots and they are uh, derogatorily referred to as reparations in this show and that's one of a big plot point in the second episode Regina Quick King's character Sister Knight is one of the beneficiaries of these particular reparations and her character kind of kind of builds from there there's a big twist as I mentioned um, again something that Damon Lindelof does in all his series the first episode had a twist at the end the second episode we find out that Jack Crawford the captain 
who died at the end of the first episode might actually be the leader of the Seventh Cavalry because uh, Regina King, Sister Knight, finds uh, basically a Ku Klux Klan kind of um, white hood and white um, robe in his closet. So that was the twist at the end. Uh, and uh, in a few of the things that we also got to saw, uh, got to see is, uh, you know, we saw, we see Jeremy Irons playing, at first he's not mentioned who we see, we get to know, I mean, most of the fans of the comic would have guessed uh, based on the way he speaks and a few subtle clues here and there. He's basically a much older Adrian White, uh, Ozymandias, and he is trapped somewhere. I don't know where yet. There are a lot of speculations in further episodes. But he's trapped somewhere and he is, uh, he spends his time to, um, coming up with a play of sorts called The Watchmaker's Son, which is none other than Dr. Manhattan. And we get to see a recreation of uh, Dr. Manhattan's genesis uh, in, the, in this play. And we get to see that famous big blue dick. And uh, you know, it's quite famous from the graphic novel. It's also, it was also shown in the uh, unrated edition of the Watchmen film as well. It's something quite famous and it's good to see that we get to see the same things here. It's not forgotten. I remember, if you remember correctly, Ozymandias is kind of hinted as, as, as being a closeted homosexual and the fact that he uh, actually you know, kind of concentrates on this particular part of uh, <laughs> Dr. Manhattan is quite uh, funny. Now as we move on to um, uh, episode 3. Episode 3, we first get to see Ozymandias in the full purple and gold uh, Ozymandias costume, complete with the headband, Jeremy Irons. I mean, what can I say? He's a delight as Ozymandias, man. He's, there's, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to choose your favorite character from this show if there's one con that I can say because almost all the uh, lead characters are well written. They are witty, they are funny, they are badass, they kick, uh, they kick butts, you know, they, they, are great. They, they have great action sequences as well. Some of them don't, like Ozzy Deus, but he steals the show in, uh, he's still, he's, he's basically eating, uh, chewing the scenery in each scene that he's in, and he seems to have been born to play the much older Ozzy Um we also get introduced to another character that uh, you might know from the graphic novel, uh, Laurie Juspasik, uh, or here yeah, she takes uh, her father's name, Laurie Blake, played fantastically well by Jean Smart. So for those of you who don't know, she is basically the daughter of the comedian and the first Silk, Silk Spectre. And in this, um, the in the, the timeline after the events of the novel, she basically joins the government side and becomes a member of the uh, FBI in exchange for perhaps a lighter sentence from her crimes. And uh, in this, this, this particular episode, the episode is uh, very um, centric to Laurie Blake's character. We get to see that she really is the daughter of the comedian because she makes a lot of quips. She's acerbic, um, sarcastic, and Jean Smart is perfectly casted to play her. Uh, she has this, uh, you know, running joke that she keeps talking, uh, she keeps saying throughout the episode where she's on the phone to Dr. Manhattan, you know, recording a message for Dr. Manhattan. And, you know, it, it goes on like, uh, um, you know, there's, there's a start of joke and then it goes on to the punchline and then she, it's the, it's the famous brick joke uh, you know, that you might have heard before and then, you know, roll on snare drum, curtains, good joke. She actually says the exact lines from the comic as well. And then we move on to episode 4. Um, where we get to see something called the Loop Man. That's what it's, it's being called in uh, in uh, on the threads um, online. It's being called Loop Man, a very strange character who I think and many people online think that he might be 
uh, the FBI agent PT because of how he looks he's very lanky tall guy and uh, we also get introduced to Lady Trio who has taken over the white industries in this iteration of the show um, she's basically portrayed as a as this you know um, reclusive businesswoman who basically runs the world and there is a hint that she might be the comedian's daughter with the woman that he shot in the novel um, the Vietnamese woman that he shot in the novel there is a hint that that uh, the that uh, the character Lady Chu might be actually their illegitimate daughter and uh, I don't know it's possible it's not been said explicitly but that's um, that's my theory uh, we as I mentioned, you know, Jeremy Iron is a fantastic delight. In this particular episode, there's a scene where they show how he has this um he, he has this ability to make clones. Mm. So he clones like um, a male and a female helper for him to help uh, help him out uh, to perform his experiments. So basically, the particular storyline involving Adrian White's character. Uh, basically, each episode is a year in his life um, during his imprisonment in wherever the place he's been uh, prisoned in. There's a lot of rumors about it. And uh, he, he, so basically, he does his experiments, a lot of the clones get killed uh, by very, very easy. Ludicrous means, but highly entertaining. And in this episode, they basically show how he. Uh, he makes the clones, how he uh, how he gets the clones. The clones are actually, how do you say, uh, born in a kind of a crab cage in the middle of the lake. So he goes out late at night to catch, to collect the clone babies. Yes, they are actual babies uh, from the clone cages. He checks them and he just nonchalantly throws the crying baby, actually a live client crying baby, back into the lake because you know it's just kind of like a discarded fish so that's the kind of character that Adrian White is and Jeremy Irons is is perfect I mean he gives you in all the strange ways he makes you laugh even though anybody else doing that might make you feel a bit disgusted he makes you laugh because of the way he does it because of his size his facial expressions and so on and then so and and then we move on to episode 5 the most recent episode um, which was released on Sunday my opinion the best episode so far of the series uh, my favorite episode as well because it is um, a portal episode um, now Damon Lindelof as I mentioned creator of um, Lost and the Leftovers from way back when has this knack of writing these kind of uh, portal episodes um, and he has done the same for uh, for Lost some of the best episodes uh, from Lost were written by him, um, like the uh, Terry centric episode Walkabout, or the uh, Desmond centric episode uh, Live Together Die Alone. And in fact, in Leftovers, he did the same thing uh, with two boats and a, and a helicopter, the Max centric episode. A lot of these episodes are bottle episodes, which mean, basically means it, it follows a single character, a singular character, throughout a couple of days. How they go about their life and in this particular episode um, we follow uh, the character by the name of looking glass which is played by tim blake nelson and um, as i mentioned earlier it's very difficult to choose your favorite character but at the end of this episode i really liked i think i flip flop a few times throughout the season so far and right now um, looking glass is my favorite character now i'll tell you why um, Looking Glass is, um, you know, he he has this. He was part of the incident that happened on um, 11/2, as it's called in the United States, or the incident of 2nd November 1985, where this um, giant monster squid, alien squid, uh, gets teleported and lands in in Manhattan and uh, the resulting psychic blast causes a lot of damage a lot of uh, people were killed and a lot of survivors were traumatically affected by it and first of all what I have to say is oh my god a giant squid I mean Damon Lindelof is literally saying oh okay 
So you guys thought that you know having a giant squid is a bit too strange to have it on a big screen. Uh, you know, like what Zack Snyder did, he had to change it. He made it uh, Doctor Manhattan's form in the film, and in this part, in this particular episode, he starts it off with the squid. So he's like saying, you know, screw you guys. I mean, I'm gonna do what I want to do. This is how I see how the show is meant to be. It's gonna be bonkers all out there. And he lands that giant squid in the middle of Manhattan. It, it's tentacles all over Hoboken and the rest of the uh, boroughs in uh, New York. And you know that. But I mean, I was sitting here and watching the that particular episode after a little help and. Um, and you know if you can that little help really will make you enjoy this whole show and i was like oh my what am i watching i mean this is is unheard of you know you don't really see this kind of scenes in uh, in in uh, of course you know you saw the dragons in game of thrones and you know um uh, you know, other kind of monsters and such things uh, zombies in the walking dead but you never expect to see an alien squid you know you never do uh, you know, especially it from it being taken from the novel itself um, so and that's how the episode starts so this particular event how it affects looking glass how he goes through his life he starts to become a recluse of sorts uh, with a literal tinfoil hat in this case he wears a reflective mask uh, which uh, blocks out the psychic blast that affects a lot of other people and uh, which allows him to sleep more comfortably and so on and he adopts it as his superhero persona in this show and uh, and as I mentioned Tim Blake Nelson was uh, is fantastic as well you really feel sympathy for him uh, all the kind of shit that he's been put through in his life and yet he keeps falling for it I mean dude it's literally right in front of you and you got to be more uh, you know be more wary of who you speak with because you keep getting into these situations and then you end up being hurt or heartbroken please stop and also at the beginning of that particular of this particular episode you see a lot of nods to the comic book it's to the graphic novel itself you see the knot tops the uh, counterculture movement that kind of has replaced the skinhead movement because those guys with the samurai knots at the top of their head there's a mention of a pale horse apparently in this universe Schindler's List was never made um, Steven Spielberg made a film called The Pale Horse which was based on that whole particular um, incident the squid landing in Manhattan and apparently it won a gazillion Oscars so uh, uh, that actually pale horse is based on the band that was playing in Madison Square Garden in the novel and on all the people who were watching them were killed in that particular incident so it's a nice nod to that uh, and uh, you know what else can I say this then I can't wait for the next episode um, Watchmen has basically brought me back to those times in 2004 you know um, trolling internet forums searching for theories on lost in fact, in 2011, 2010, 2012, we had read it. So that's where we used to go for uh, the leftover theories and speculation. And now I'm doing the same thing for Watchmen. I can't wait for the next episode, episode 6 from the previews. Look even more bonkers. In fact, it seems to be uh, something along the likes of uh, the lost episode, The Constant. Or the leftovers episode, The International Assassin, where it happens kind of in the head and I don't know I'm looking forward to it it looks really bad badass as I, I mean I keep saying that but that's the only time I've said it uh, in all my reviews so far because it, it truly is one of the best series this year 2019 and uh, I'm looking forward to the next episode um, you know and what else can I say but uh, you know quiz custodia ipsos custodis who watches the watchman are you watching the watchman um, this has been a presentation of Badass Reviews. Pick up that remote, like, share, comment, do that thing. But most importantly, keep calm and rock on.